The following program is made possible in part by the Dayton Bar Association. Hello and welcome to You in the Law. I'm Mike Monda, your producer and host for uh, today's program. And the topic for today is a timely one. We're about a month and a half away from uh, tax filing deadline. So we're going to talk about taxes, income taxes, myths about taxes. Might even talk about bitcoins if we get that far. Joining me as a guest on our show, and uh, he's been here many years and uh, is one of the fine tax experts in the Miami Valley uh, area um, with Cowan and Hilgeman, um, uh, Chris Cowan, uh, attorney at law, and uh, he will be fielding our questions and <clears throat> hopefully fielding your questions. Uh, before we get to questions for Chris, uh, let me remind you that You and the Law is a monthly presentation produced here at the studios of the Dayton Access Television, DATV. Uh, are we still on Time Warner? Well, it used to be Time Warner, Channel 5, it might be Comcast before we know it, uh, is the public access channel of Time Warner right now, their cable network here in Dayton. Programs also cable cast north and south uh, on, I believe, public access channel 6 on the Continental Cable Network through the auspices of the Miami Valley Cable Council executive producer for the program was the originator of this show, former uh, domestic relations judge Mike Brigner. Now I'm going to remind you that this is a live uh, call-in show and uh, periodically, uh, hopefully quite a bit, we'll see the number for you to call in if you're watching which is 223-5311. Uh, we are sponsored as you saw at the beginning by the Dayton Bar Association uh, located uh, downtown here uh, with its director Bill Wheeler. Uh, there's also live streaming of this program and uh, if, if you're not within our television um, uh, area you can watch us, hopefully you're watching us right now on DATV.org. So uh, let me uh, turn to our guest and uh, Chris Cowan, ask him to introduce himself, tell us, the viewing audience, a little bit about his background and familiarity with uh, tonight's topic. Good evening, Chris. How are you? Mike, I'm good. Welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, Mike, I'm a retooled uh, CPA. I was in the public accounting business in the 70s and I went back to school at UD. And uh, Mike, since 81, I've been practicing law in the Miami Valley. A uh, big bulk of my practice is tax work or transactional uh, events that revolve some tax element to the transaction. All right, and uh, so you've been practicing since 81, which uh, gets you up close to the 30-some year um, category, right? Mike, I think I'm over 30 years. Yeah. 30 years and counting, thank well, you. Well, we're not math majors here, so. But uh, pretty close. So, all right, any, um, anything we ought to know this year about uh, any changes in taxes, uh, income tax, estate tax, anything mm -hmm. like that? What's, what's the big new topics? Well, let me give you a couple uh, broad brush concepts and then we can bore in and drill down as much as you want. Uh, in a non-income tax thing that really isn't super timely, but I'm still getting a lot of phone calls on it, Mike, is, and I'm not talking about income tax now, I'm talking about <laughs> a DEF tax, is we have phenomenal taxpayer relief in Ohio because Ohio repealed its DEF tax for Ohio residents, uh, actually effective uh, 1 one thirteen. No DEF tax uh, in Ohio, no matter what size your state. So if modest state, large state, uh, Bill Gates type of state, no problem. Uh, we have no death tax in Ohio for Ohio residents. So uh, the old exemption, crude, was $300,000 for a single person. 
uh, and there's plenty of people in Ohio that were single and had more than $300,000, they were paying approximately 7%. So uh, if somebody had uh, half a million, three minus three from a half a million would be 200000 so fourteen or $15,000 uh, would be a complete tax savings for that individual. So that, that is a, uh, that's a big move for Ohio to go to a non-tax state. Does this affect uh, the federal estate tax in any way? Is there any changes in that, thresholds? No, whatever? they'd be different, just like state income ta tax and federal estate tax. Uh, we do have uh, great relief on the federal level, too. Uh, we have a 2.5 uh, million, 5 million plus exemption for a single person and 10 million plus for uh, married couples, Mike. So uh, lots of people in Ohio are going to be able to pass their property on to family, friends, whatnot, uh, with no death tax ramifications on either the federal or the state level. Now that's fluctuated uh, uh, during the past 10, 12, 15 years. Um, are we in any danger of that uh, dropping back to a million or going up to 10 million? Or well, you know, the history of the death tax has been all over the place. It's, it, within the last eight years, it's maybe been as low as a million. Uh, we had one year, a very unusual year, because of uh, gridlock in Congress where we had uh, no death tax. That was 2010, and George Steinbrenner and some other very wealthy people died that year, and Congress got back to work and got to uh, 3.5, and then it's been increased a number of times to now over five million. They say it's permanent. It was passed as permanent legislation. But, <laughs> but, but <laughs> nothing's permanent. <laughs> nothing's uh, permanent. Mike, you and I know yes. that uh, if enough folks vote to change it, well, then we would have some sort of tax uh, change. But I can say this, President Obama campaigned on 3.5 million. Uh, the Republicans wanted more. And so he and Congress got to a $5 million plus deal. So uh, no one's talking on the literature or the, uh, the trades, uh, what's going on in the tax world, of any pushback off the $5 million. So I think that's very safe. And Ohio just repealed its death tax. And uh, so I think for the foreseeable future, uh, very good for taxpayers for both the federal and state death tax. You know, something we, we've, all these years, we've never really talked about it in the show, and I, I don't know if there's anything really to talk about, but uh, a couple of times a week, there's a, a, a lottery here in, uh, you know, Powerball, Ohio, Lotto, I guess, and Mega Millions. Um, when, uh, when folks win those, and occasionally they do, uh, is there any danger that they're going to be ensnared by any of this um, uh, state tax uh, business or income tax or is there something they should be doing or did I catch you from left field? No, you caught one? me at a great spot because yeah. actually two weeks ago one of my clients won a million dollars in the lottery. Yes. Uh, and he's a married guy, he's a middle class guy. It wasn't uh, me, was it? No, oh, okay. it, was, it wasn't <laughs> I'd you. know if I called in. It again. wasn't you. But, I mean, a million dollars, well first of all, uh, the game he won, uh, for him to get the million now, there's a discount off the million. I don't know the exact number. It's like 40% off of that. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't really get a million. He gets, let's say, you six. You get the present day yeah, value. Yeah, he, he gets a discounted value. But so mm -hmm. let's say 600. Now he's got to pay income tax uh, on the 600. So let's just say half for federal, state, and everything else. So now you're at three. Uh, I mean, that's still pretty good for a scratch off or whatever it was. Uh, but he's nowhere near uh, the federal death tax because he's married and it's $10 million for a husband and wife. So he's totally fine. You'd have to win a huge lottery for a normal person to have to pay federal death tax. It would have to be $15 million or something. Do you have a thought of you know, along these same lines? And, of course, uh, the Powerball and Mega Millions are... Uh, nationwide, so we don't always have an Ohio winner, but uh, more often than not, I think on the Ohio lotto, we, we do have an Ohio winner. Um, is there some like advice, uh, as a tax attorney, you would uh, suggest for somebody to either take these incrementally year by year yeah. or take the whole thing or 
or is it just kind of a matter of yeah. choice? I mean, you'd have to look to see what that person wants, what their health is, what their desires are, how good they are with money. I've actually had three uh, million dollar winners now in my practice. Three clients have won. Uh, they've all taken the money cash. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure there's some situations where there might be some uh, advantage to taking the payout. But I think most of these people take the dollars. They'd rather yeah. have the money and, and deal with it than have to wait on the government. But maybe if you're younger, like you were in your 20s or 30s, yeah, that taking could, it over 25 years might yeah. be a... You'd have to talk and do, do some that, numbers, yeah. maybe get a financial mm -hmm. planner in there also. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Um, one of the things that uh, has been kind of a hot topic over the past year is uh, uh, defensive marriage acts in various uh, states um, uh, and, uh, you know, same-sex marriage uh, mm -hmm. was decided in some fashion by the uh, Supreme Court. We won't go into that, but um, it's my understanding there's some uh, potential tax uh, ramifications here in Ohio on that. We, we have tax ramifications, and to this extent, Mike, uh, Ohio has a constitutional ban against uh, Ohio same-sex marriages. Right. But there are plenty of states and other countries, too, where folks can get married uh, and have a same-sex marriage. And what we have now is a uh, split in how the tax agencies are treating this. The federal government is saying this, if you were married in a state that uh, recognizes same-sex or another country, the U.S. government says you're married. They don't care where you're living. So if you're in Ohio, even though Ohio does not have same-sex Ohio marriage laws, the IRS says you file a return, uh, just like a husband and wife would, a married filing a tax return, and you can elect to file jointly, like how a lot of spouses do, mm -hmm. or you can file married filing separately, and perhaps, depending on what the economics are and support and stuff, you may also may be able to file a head of household. Um, so what's happening is you're going to be, if you will, forced uh, to be treated as married because you were married, even though Ohio does not recognize it. Mm -hmm. But Ohio says this. Ohio then would want a separate tax return for the same-sex couple. So you're going to be locked into at least three tax returns, a, a joint return maybe, or if you're going to file separately with the feds, uh, married separate and married separate, and definitely two separate Ohio tax returns for the same-sex couple because Ohio will not allow you to file one return like a husband and wife would mm -hmm. using the federal numbers coming over to the state return. Okay. So we have a, so we have a, we have, and this is the first year for this, so this is all new. Uh, no one's really done this in Ohio before, at least not legally, uh, is to file a same-sex married tax return for the federal and then split up for the Ohio. Okay, so if they are legally married outside the country or in the country in one of the states that allows that, Ohio gives, I guess, full faith and credit to it. It's required to by it's the federal required government. Required to. And, um, uh, but then uh, you have a choice of filing separately? You could file married filing separately, okay. yeah. And you could work the numbers both ways to see which way is the most advantageous for you, uh, either married separately mm -hmm. or married jointly compared to the higher returns. Okay, now you said there were like three returns you'd have to make. Okay, so the federal is one. That'd right? be one, file one jointly. And Ohio's going to say because they don't recognize the marriage, one each for each of the same sex people. Okay. And so it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a little flat footed because yes. we have, it's flat footed because we have different rules on marriage and the government's saying one set of body of rules and the Ohio taxation people are saying, uh, we don't recognize that, and we're treating you as non-married people for Ohio. So if you file joint federally, mm -hmm. and then let's say you send in your joint in Ohio, they're just going to kick it back? Uh, yeah, if they realize that you're a same-sex couple, uh, they will reject that return, and my guess is they would reprocess it as two individual returns being filed in Ohio. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm not sure how many we have. Mm -hmm. uh, but if Ohio learns that it's a, 
an attempt to file a joint return for a same-sex marriage, my understanding the, the Department of Taxation will not honor it. Okay. So we have to wait until Ohio allows it then to file two joint yeah. returns. We're not there yet. Okay. We're not there. They're, they're requiring two separate returns for the same-sex same sex couple. Okay. We're about 20 minutes into the program here, and uh, we're talking with uh, Chris Cowan, uh, a local attorney, tax expert, former CPA, correct? Still, I still have my CPA license. Yeah. yeah. Well, full-time. Full -time. Are you full-time CPA also? Uh, back in the day, I was. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was been a while. Uh, and we're inviting your questions about uh, taxation. Our number is 223-5311, and I, there it is. If we could keep that on just a little bit more. I, I don't know what our attention span of our viewers is. I hope it's high, uh, but sometimes they forget. So um, you're watching You and the Law. We're sponsored by the Dayton Bar Association. And uh, uh, since the good folks over there at the DBA are kind enough to sponsor us, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Um, we have been in service of the community. Okay. <laughs> and there's a call waiting, and I'll get it just a second. No, I'll get it right now. Let's get the call right now. We'll get back to the DBA in a minute. The DBA can wait. Yeah, DBA. They're fine. Good evening. You're on You and the Law. Uh, hi, how are you? Great. Okay, I have a quick question. I, I just tuned in, so I don't know if you covered it. Um, so here's the situation. We're, we're, uh, my fiance and I are, are working on filing our taxes, and we bought a house uh, early 2013, and we uh, are not married yet. And so I'm looking through the itemized deductions, and I know we can uh, deduct in uh, interest payments, but we don't know whose tax we're trying to put it on because we split everything pretty much down the center. And since we can't file jointly, um, we're kind of confused as to maybe what we should do. Okay, excellent uh, question. Complex, uh, but uh, Chris is mulling this over and he's yeah, going to tell you about yeah, it. Yeah, that's a real good question. Now, we have a lot of people who are sharing space who aren't married, and mm -hmm. they're not allowed, as, as he's pointed out, and correctly so, that two unmarried people can't just elect just to file right. married because they're not married. So we have some interest deduction. We also have real estate taxes. Uh, if there's a home office, we have a home office in the house. We could have a lot of complexity on the tax return. Clearly, the deduction should be taken. Uh, now, if one person is paying all the bills, uh, we're not going to be able to have an allocation over to the other person. If, as he kind of indicated, uh, Mike, it, both people are paying the real estate taxes mm -hmm. and the interest on the home, mm -hmm. I think a safe position would be if it's 50 50, they take. 50-50 each. Mm -hmm. uh, and truthfully, I have done similar sort of things many, many times, and I can think of no pushback from the IRS. I, I don't think they're too worried, truthfully, uh, about whether it's a 45% contribution or a 75% contribution. Mm -hmm. I think as long as both people in the household are contributing to the household, the bills are getting paid, any reasonable allocation between the one person and the other person in the house for the deductible items uh, should be no problem. Now, there is a little bit of a matching issue because I'm guessing that the uh, real estate taxes and the interest, Mike, are going to be reflected on only one Social Security number. You're not going to get from countywide or a key bank uh, a breakout on the interest. So uh, you may want to put a little explanation on the tax return on why the uh, statements from the bank aren't going to match up with your tax return. Okay, like a, a written affidavit? Or a little note, or a, note a little explanation uh, okay. of what's going on. Uh, I've done that sort of thing, and, and again, I don't think there's going to be any problem with the, uh, with the deductions going through. Okay, so they can each take the percentage that they want as long as they should probably put some explanation yeah, in. Yeah, as long as it's reasonable. Right. Right? I mean, as long as it's reasonable, I think it'll be totally fair. Okay. Uh, does that answer your question? Are you still there? Well, we may have lost our caller, but that was a good question. That's and, a good uh, question. Very common situation, too. And, uh, yeah, um, uh, in this day and age, um, 
I, I think it is. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> I was talking about the DBA. Should I get back to the DBA or? Sure, why not? Af after that, well, unless we get another call, and uh, we, we take all calls as soon as we get them, um, unless you're in the middle of a explanation. You can always interrupt. We can always interrupt. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so uh, our sponsor, the Bar Association, uh, one of their services um, is a Wills for Heroes, and, and we that is uh, volunteer members of the Bar Association create uh, Wills for first responders um, who are, you know, firefighters, um, police, EMTs, uh, and we are having a um, event. Uh, this, uh, if I can my thing here, it's this um, Saturday, and it's out in Huber Heights. Uh, give me just a minute here. You, I bet you thought I didn't have it, right? Uh, it's out at the Huber Heights Administration Headquarters, 7008 Brant Pike, Huber Heights, Ohio. Four five four two four. If you fall into that category, you don't have a will. Uh, go on out there, and they'll prepare one for you. Uh, Bill Wheelers, the executive director of the Dayton Bar Association, has been for a number of years. Uh, has been holding this together in uh, fine fashion, um, and uh, the Bar Association's been in operation since 1883, which is now. Uh, what would that be? Like about 130 well, years. Long, <laughs> 131 years. So, um, and uh, serving the community, and we're we're real happy with that, and we're happy with their sponsorship. So, let's get back to taxes here. Let's talk about some tax myths um, because there are plenty of them. There's a lot of tax myths. A lot of tax myths, and um, let's talk about myth number one which I don't know how much you'll have to say about this, but that uh, they're illegal, inval invalid, or voluntary. Yeah, we've done a couple of constitutional shows yeah. in the past. Mike, uh, uh, that path has been beaten and worn out. Uh, what type of folks would, uh, do they, are they just kidding themselves, or do they actually feel that way just so they can avoid filing and or paying? Uh, I can only tell you my experience. Uh, every couple of years, I'll run across a tax protester. And normally, they come to me, not on the front end, where maybe with some advice, they wouldn't get into such mischief. But usually, it's at the back end, where a number of years have gone by, where they've said that uh, the collecting of tax is illegal, that uh, the, uh, that the cases are improperly interpreted in favor of the IRS, that it's a, a levying of money and they don't have to voluntarily pay, that IRS has to get the money from them. Uh, and there's workshops and seminars. You can go on the internet. There's, there's, there's quite a bit out there where people are preying on somebody's hope that there's a illegality to the whole tax code. And when I see them, it's usually after a long period of time and the interest and the penalties and tax have built up to a sizable number and now we're trying to work something out with the IRS. Well, wasn't there, uh, let me stop you just for a second. We have a constitutional amendment to levy taxes, don't we? Yes, and we have a whole <laughs> series. <laughs> and that's 100 years old, right? And we have a whole series of, of case law. I mean, the tax code itself, Mike, is 73,000 pages and it's been interpreted yeah. I mean, literally countless times by all sorts of U.S. courts. So it's a total myth. Uh, but unfortunately, people just buy into it. It's kind of like the Flat Earth Society. Uh, they they want to believe it, and they do, and they're beguiled by somebody who's a little bit of a slick talker, and next thing you know... But they have to pay for these seminars to they, not pay taxes. Yeah, right? they pay to the seminar, or uh, they just get incredibly crummy advice, and... They're willing to pay several hundred dollars for maybe a fake W-2 or a, a bogus 1099, or they put uh, 15 dependents down on their tax return, or uh, inflate charitable contributions. Uh, there's a zillion ways to get the tax numbers 
down uh, with either understating income or overstating deductions, and so they buy into this. And it's just a total, uh, it's, it's a total can, farce. Can you get in trouble for that? <laughs> yeah, you can get in trouble for that. Uh, they, pro they will, um, the IRS only has so much money to go after people. Mm -hmm. uh, but people who are abusive of the system or who are linked together into a common, um, a common sort of conspiracy type, clearly the people who are the promoters or the people who are the sellers of these programs uh, have had several cases where they have been uh, prosecuted by the IRS. Uh, you start filing false fraudulent income tax returns, your chances of being uh, prosecuted by the IRS go up. Uh, nobody gets prosecuted for a math error, or you make a mistake of going to the wrong tax table, or you don't sign the return properly. Um, but a pattern of, of fraudulent returns is, is, is a prescription for problems with the IRS. Well, some of those things are just like red flags in front of a bull, aren't they? They're so unusual. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's so off the chart uh, that there's really no way to explain it. Okay. All right. So your free advice is don't do that. Right? Don't do that, please. <laughs> and if somebody came into the office and said that, you could you'd give them the same free advice. The same say, advice. The okay. advice is do not do that, please. All right. Let's talk about some other red flags here. Uh, how about... Um, uh, somebody has two or three dogs and cats. Uh, what about? <laughs> that, that's a good one because if, okay. if you're, you're old enough to remember, I am too, uh, we never had to put social security numbers down for children and dependents and uh, other things right. like that. Or if you were, had a household and taking care of a relative. Uh, the year that the IRS required, and I can't remember whether it was 12 or 14 years ago or whatever it was, the year that the IRS implemented no deduction for a child unless you had a tax number for that child. Mm -hmm. Something like 13 million people disappeared. Daisy and Fluffy and all the turtles, <laughs> and cats and dogs. Yeah, they all they all disappeared. And so uh, now those people are all matched in through the Social Security system. And uh, you know it, it was just not just one year. It's been year after year after year after year. So uh, that technical requirement. Uh, ha is supposedly one of the largest revenue or savers by the IRS at the least cost to implement. Okay, and I'm assuming you can't get a Social Security number for your cat. I'm sure there's people who have <laughs> got Social Security numbers of dead people and uh, other sort of mischief, but it, it dropped the numbers significantly. Okay. <clears throat> Some people think that uh, if you don't file, the IRS uh, should file for you. That sometimes will actually will happen. That, that's kind of a, almost a myth. Um, uh, if IRS, uh, if you don't file a tax return and there's enough data in the computer for them to do it, if they have bank statements, if they have W-2s, if they have oil well 1099s, uh, Oftentimes, th they will do a return. Now, often when the IRS does a return for you, they forget all your deductions, interest, charity, mm -hmm. medical, and so you get a tax return that's a skeletal tax return that I've never seen really be too pro-taxpayer. Mm -hmm. But just stand alone, does the IRS have to do a tax return for you? No. Sometimes they do, though, when they want to make assessments and do other sort of things. Okay. But they have no requirement to do it. The taxpayer is required to prepare the tax return. How about... Um, but let me say one other thing. The okay. IRS, and I, I haven't been to the federal building yet this year, but in prior years, there's a, um, there's a counter service at the federal building mm -hmm. where for certain simple tax returns, if, if you're inclined to wait, uh, it's first come, first serve. Right. You can go right up to the federal building, I think it's on the fourth floor, uh, and they'll prepare a tax return for you for free. Hey, I, also, I saw... Um, I was watching uh, Channel 7 last night, uh, not necessarily to give them a plug, but uh, uh, on their uh, Sunday morning show, they were talking about uh, some community services mm -hmm. do voluntary. Um, uh, yeah, uh, University of Dayton uh, mm -hmm. has a tax clinic. There's different uh, charities in town. 
uh, where you can get a tax return prepared for free. Uh, that's out there as, as public service type things. When they, when they do that, and I'm sure you're not over there watching them or anything like that, is that just for simple returns or could it be as complex as? Yeah, uh, uh, I just don't know what the requirements are. Mm -hmm. uh, my guess is if there was businesses and major rental properties and uh, maybe some complexities not in sort of the mainstream, they may not be so inclined to do it. Yeah. Uh, but there are services out there for people to get returns prepared at, at, um, at, uh, for no cost. Okay. Um, let's talk about a one that's always a big one is the, the home office. Oh, the home office. Deductions. Now, the, it, well. If you have, if you have, a, yeah, if you, this is a problem. IRS is very, I'm not going to say every return gets audited that it has a home office, but statistically, if you take a home office deduction, uh, it's one of those little flags in your tax return where you have a little higher chance. Obviously, it has to be a business enterprise. It has to be for profit. Uh, IRS wants you to have a dedicated room that's not your TV room and not your pool room. And you could have a TV kid. in it, though. You could probably have a TV mm -hmm. in it, but you're supposed to have a dedicated space. Then you have to do some, there's some math complications. You have to figure out what your square footage is. You have to allocate off the items, real estate taxes, heat, light, and power, insurance, and all those things. And so it's an area of the law where, truthfully, a lot of the time, the deduction is hardly worth the labor. Mm -hmm. uh, the bookkeeping, the accounting, the allocations, uh, most people often sort of get frustrated with it and IRS doesn't like it. Uh, but if you have a valid business purpose for the right space and uh, your documentation is good, you'll, ha you'll have a deduction for the home office. That's correct. Students don't have to pay taxes? <laughs> oh, that's cute. Is that, a good, is that a good myth? No, they pay taxes just like everybody else. Okay, so it is a myth that they don't. A lot of them don't that. because their income is low and there's enough deductions and, right. and whatnot where they don't have to pay. But if a student has interest, dividends, W-2, uh, other sort of incomes that get them above their personal exemption and itemized deduction or standard deduction, they're going to pay income tax. That's just like old people, there's a, a thought too that at, you know, at 72 or 85 or some number that you should be exempt from income taxes because you've been paying for Sure. 55 or 65 right. years yeah. or what have you, but that's not true. There's no, there's no age that's too young or age that's too old. Um, I, I can't remember when this service stopped, but uh, years ago the taxpayer would get a big clump of uh, booklets and mm -hmm. things like that depending on what they had filed before Yeah. and uh, they don't send those out anymore. Uh, I don't think, unless you request them. Y yeah, I think uh, individual taxpayers still may be able to get a booklet, mm -hmm. but uh, somebody who's had their return prepared by a preparer, mm -hmm. uh, the IRS will cut them off on publications. Uh, so it's a paper saving, postage, uh, overhead cost. Uh, it's all on the internet. So many people now are on the internet all the forms and publications right. on the internet, so you can have access to them. And uh, the most instructions, too. Yeah, and the federal building mm -hmm. and post offices and other public places have most of the, uh, the forms uh, at least at, at those locations. I think the library, too, maintains um, mm -hmm. uh, a pretty good uh, portfolio of, of tax forms and instructions. There, all, the, all the tax uh, agencies seem to be encouraging the taxpayers to file electronically. Mm -hmm. It's mandated, mandated for preparers. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're out there on your lonesome or mm -hmm. whatever, you have the option. Mm -hmm. um, what would you suggest for uh, people who have been doing paper things for yeah. years and years? And then, uh, yeah, is it um, are there checks and balances on it? Suppose you make mistakes, yeah. or uh, well, once it's gone, is it gone? That type well, of I was a uh, reluctant e-file uh, er. Now, why would you be reluctant? Uh, I was reluctant because I was afraid of uh, using the communications with IRS. I have a lot of older clients who have used to seeing sort of. Mm -hmm. a paper tax return and signing the return and 
uh, there's an education process and sort of a confidence in the system. I was actually uh, late to the game mm -hmm. on the e-filing, but I'm a believer. Uh, and the reason why I'm a believer, if you look at the IRS's website and what are the 15 or 20 common mistakes that mm -hmm. a taxpayer would make, Mike, it's stuff like this. Uh, the math was wrong. The tax table was wrong. I forgot to sign the return. I didn't date the return. Uh, I didn't have a Social Security number for one of the kids. It's all little uh, foot faults, mm -hmm. all little uh, things that are just little tiny errors. You cannot file the return electronically uh, with any of those errors. The, the government won't accept it electronically, it and so you get it back. And so mm -hmm. what happens is when you finally get that return to the IRS, it's been scrubbed up. It's been buffed up, just like going through mm -hmm. a car wash. All the little nits and gnats that uh, get you, yep. uh, they're all cleaned up. Uh, you know, like you just forgot to check whether you're married or, or, or filing separately. It tells I, you. I mean, on the tax return, there's just a hundred little things that you got to do if you're going to do it manually or by paper that's all cleaned up and housekeeped. What about your math? Same thing. I mean, the math is perfect. The math will be perfect or it won't go through the uh, e-file. Yeah, the, the forms add them up. The computer, the computer that puts it together mm -hmm. has it arithmetically perfect. Uh, and so the, the if, if, if I think I even gave you the 20 common things for uh, mm -hmm. the IRS. They're all taken care of electronically. Well, that's, um, uh, it, what do you think the percentage of incidents of the usual taxpayer, you know, even, even, even good taxpayers, um, you know, meticulous, making a mistake? That's a fun question. I don't know if we've talked about this, but the Wall Street Journal used to do a contest mm -hmm. where they would have not a little W-2 and two itemized deductions and two kids, but they would give a very complex uh, tax return. Mm -hmm. And then they would submit it to the public and they would say, who's going to have the right answer? Mm -hmm. Well, there were a couple interesting things. I mean, the difference in tax, say there might be 500 or 1,000 people submitted the tax right. return. Th there would be an enormous range. It could be refunds to tax paid off the same return. Mm -hmm. And the charge for the tax return would be everything from a couple hundred dollars yeah. to, you know, $7,500. Yeah. And it, it's, it is amazing how complicated uh, the income tax return is, especially if you have somebody that has a lot of stuff going on. Right. Well. Most people, um, I, I, and maybe you can tell us, um, the deductions have gone up and uh, I, I think the threshold for, say, like uh, Schedule C's have gone up, uh, right, or not? Well, the tax brackets have creeped up for the highest paying taxpayers. Right. Most of the other deductions and brackets amounts have stayed pretty the same. Mm -hmm. Now, we do have... Uh, I guess we'll call it a penalty or surcharge for the highest earners. Uh, they get to pay a, a part of the budget and uh, the uh, Obamacare is a 3.8% mm -hmm. uh, extra tax people get to pay on passive income over uh, 450000 if you're married. That's a pretty high tax bracket, but it's, you know, another 3.8%. Uh, they're at the highest bracket now, 396 uh, they also get to pay an extra Medicare tax if they're over 250. So there are some extra uh, taxes, but conceptually, if you look long term, I mean, I'm old enough to remember the 70s mm -hmm. when the highest tax bracket was 70% plus, over like $100,000. So, so we've had, easy for me to say, uh, we've had a large reduction in the highest marginal tax rates, mm -hmm. there's no doubt about it, but still, if somebody's paying 40% of the IRS and seven to Ohio, pretty soon, you know, you, you're moving into uh, some higher tax brackets, something north of 50. You, you hark back to those days when, I, and I think there was a time when 90%, yeah. if, if you made zillions, I guess. Yeah, um, actually it's not that high if you'd see it, it's only several hundred thousand dollars. 
Back then. Back then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think that that was the inspiration for um, people to look for shelters and things oh, like yeah, that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it generated the whole industry of, of tax shelters mm -hmm. and all those sort of things where people were doing everything they possibly could to shelter these high, highly taxed uh, income yeah, it, would, it wouldn't seem like uh, if, if the rate is 70 or higher percent that it would be much of an incentive to keep on working. Not really. <laughs> if you're paying 70 to the IRS and 5 yeah. to, the, to the state and maybe some local tax, you're at 80 percent. I yeah. mean, it's, that's, that's a lot of tax. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So we're, we're way off that mm -hmm. with the highest level now at 39.6. Right. You're only given 4 cents or 4 yeah. dollars out of Hands. Easy to say, a little harder to pay. Yeah, well, that's, that's true. Uh, so you would encourage people to start uh, doing their electronic filing. Can you do that from the library too? Can you do it from any terminal or does it have to be? Well, you need the tax software to do the return mm -hmm. to get it shipped to the IRS. Right. Uh, I never have used TurboTax or those services, uh, but my understanding is they would web in so for whatever the turbo tax is, whether it's $39 or $49, mm -hmm. uh, it, it saves a lot of um, simple errors that could be made. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to get a little bit computer literate. You have to be able to link into the IRS. You need access to a computer. So there are some, clear, some barriers. Right. But if you have a computer, you can get on the IRS website, say you want to file electronically, you get the forms and it does it. That's my I mean, understanding if you have the software to process. Yeah, you've got to input you got to get data. The, yeah, yeah, you got to get the input onto the software and get it in a form that's, let's say, I'm not a computer guy, you get it batchable so you have right. it batched up and it can ship into the service. And the service will tell you whether it's accepted or not accepted. Okay. Let's take a very short break here. Um, we have about 14 minutes and 9, 8, 7, 6, 5 seconds left in the program. Um, w you were watching you in the law, Chris Cowan, an, an attorney, <coughs> Cowan and Hilgeman. It took me about four years to actually get that right, but I, but I have now. And uh, he is an expert on uh, taxes of all sorts and has been doing this since 1981 and before that as a, a CPA. So our number here is 223-5311. I don't see it on there right now. If we could, there we go. Um, if you're out there in TV land watching um, and thinking of changing the channel, but you have a tax question, call in within the next 13 minutes and uh, Chris will be happy to uh, answer that. So um, now, let me ask you about money made over the internet and uh, I think it's thought as non-taxable, myth-wise. Well, that's a big myth. Okay. Yeah, that's right up there with bartering or uh, I say I do a tax return for you and you say you're going to mm -hmm. uh, mow my yard or tune up my car or something. Mm -hmm. All those transactions are taxable. Uh, so anything that would be, I mean, on the Internet, if it, it's you're selling books or s trading, I don't know, people go to flea markets and mm -hmm. put things on the Internet and sell it, that's clearly revenue. I mean, they have a basis in what they've purchased, so there's a net in there where you get credit for all your business expenses and stuff like that. Uh, don't worry about the lighting here. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've got candles if they all go out. <laughs> okay. And so, yeah, I mean, it'd be just like any other transaction. Uh, you know, if, 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 a bus if I'm an attorney and you pay me in cash, uh, that's reportable income to me. Mm -hmm. Or if you would uh, give me uh, a car or something like that for a fee. So anything that you would do, uh, e legal or illegal. I mean, over we, at different times, Mike, we've talked about the illegal economy and how it would be taxed and different ways to tax that, whether it's a value added or sales tax. Uh, legal activities are clearly taxed and so are illegal activities. That's Give us that's an example of an illegal activity. I mean, most people think of illegal activity as robberies or, 
or something like that. But there's a more sophisticated illegal activity. Well, which, I mean, uh, anything you, that's not legal in Ohio, I mean, we could have everything from uh, drugs to uh, selling prescription drugs. We could have, obviously, uh, prostitution. Uh, we have dog fights, uh, supposedly, in Ohio. And, uh, I just can't imagine the dog fight industry. Uh, They're probably not reporting sending, their, sending their 1099. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Okay. I mean, we, ha we have a, a vast illegal economy. Uh, there's people doing legal transactions that clearly aren't reporting. Uh, normally when the IRS talks about gapping of tax revenues, they're mm -hmm. almost always talking about legitimate business people who don't report a transaction for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, they almost never talk about the illegal economy. The illegal economy is very big. Uh, I, I would just think that if you sent in some money and said, I, I gained this from whatever activity, that <laughs> you're just making it worse for yourself. Well, you don't have that as far as a, as a crime, but I mean, I am totally 100% for a value-added tax or a national sales tax for those very reasons. Okay. Um, here's a couple that are, um, you know, folks go out to Vegas and uh, lose a bundle. <laughs> they, they spend their entire paycheck on lottery tickets and uh, yeah. they are they say, well, I'm just going to write this off. Yeah. Uh, what about that? Can well, you do that? Maybe. Maybe. They might have some winners in there. Uh -huh. And so if they have some winners, IRS will say, let's say, for example, somebody has $1,500 in winners and 5000 in losers. Okay. Okay. And so the 1500 IRS would say, uh, we're going to tax the winners, 1500 and they're allowed to take a deduction, but only up to the 1500 Okay. Now, there's sometimes some pushback because the IRS says the 1500 is a above the line, if you will, gross item, mm -hmm. just like W-2s or interest right. or dividends. But you must itemize mm -hmm. to get the gambling losses. And not everybody, we had that caller who called in who sounds like he's going to itemize. He'd be able to take the gambling losses mm -hmm. because he's going to be able to itemize. Right. But there are plenty of people out there who don't have enough charitable contributions and interest and uh, uh, real estate taxes to itemize, so they would then be sort of penalized because they would be paying tax. So once you get below the adjusted gross income, when you're above it, it's every dollar that comes in counts, and when you get below it, it's on a percentage of what your bracket is? Or Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have gambling earnings, mm -hmm. I mean, let's just take the simplest case. Somebody uh, puts a dollar in a slot machine and wins $10,000. Okay, well they have a ten thousand dollar win. They really have nothing to write off other than a dollar. The dollar yeah. But somebody could easily put in ten thousand dollars back into the machine, so they're really even. Mm -hmm. uh, but in order to make that even work on the tax return, they have to report the income and take an itemized deduction, and they may not get all the credit for the deduction. That's where there could be some right. tax. If it you wouldn't will. be one for one. It, you wouldn't get it, your. It's, it's it possible. Wouldn't, it wouldn't wash the. It, it, the it's tissue. possible, yeah. but there there's plenty of situations where it doesn't wash. As nicely. Okay. Yeah. Um, restaurant tips. Taxable? Not yeah, taxable. I hate to say that. You know, nobody wants to really no. tax the yeah, yeah. earnings that the waitress earns. Or uh, waiter. Or the waiter or the host <laughs> or however they pull them up right. or the fellow who's tending the bar or the uh, person who's helping with cleanup. But uh, all that's revenue. So uh, I have a feeling maybe not all of it gets reported. But if the IRS comes in, uh, they can do some uh, cost study. They can do some ranges. They can do some things where they can estimate. Mm -hmm. They can reconstruct. There's no, uh, there's no problem with that. Now, it would have to take probably a, a pretty big number for them to get excited about that. But it clearly is income. OK. Um. Is there a threshold for getting audited? Some people feel they don't make enough money to ever get audited. The auditing um, is a real mystery because the tax return, each of us file, your return, my return, anybody's return, every line is given a weighted number depending on how the other numbers interrelate. I mean, it could mm -hmm. be something as simple as a Beverly Hills zip code 
and you have a taxable income of fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars well you can't live in beverly hills on fifteen thousand so that could just be enough right. that, that could be enough right there to pull your return and irs is trying to be more and more efficient they're trying to audit fewer returns they're actually doing a lot more by the mail mm -hmm. or you, they might say tell us about a charitable contribution or tell us about an ir um, state tax or uh, they're trying to be more efficient and sort of spot audit uh, but but they definitely are auditing returns because truthfully when they audit uh, the return they get for the audit is very high yeah okay somebody has somebody else do their taxes an accountant H&R and I'm not singling them out but they're more well-known tax services and uh, the tax service or the uh, preparer goofs up. Yeah, uh, a preparer error. Right. Yeah, uh, if a prepare, preparer made an error, uh, most preparers would uh, most preparers would pay a. I, I can only talk about the, mm -hmm. my my experience. Uh, first of all, if if the error generated some tax, and it was. That, that the adjustment was correct, mm -hmm. uh, the taxpayer needs to pay the tax. Okay. Okay. And then there's also going to be interest. But the taxpayer had the money, and so most people would say, well, the interest should be paid by the taxpayer because they had the money. I mean, there's a, the interest rates are so low yeah. right now. But if there's a penalty because the taxpayer made the error, mm -hmm. I think most taxpayers would stand up to that. Okay. But uh, what usually happens is if you write a letter to the IRS and say, hey, you know what, uh, I'm a tax preparer and here's why I made a mistake. Uh, I thought it was this, I thought it was that. It's amazing how many times the IRS will waive the penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not really out there to try to trap people. And if it's true a mistake and it seems to be like a valid good faith mistake, oftentimes what happens is the taxpayer pays the tax, there's a little bit of interest, and IRS will be uh, uh, not so uh, confiscatory with the penalty. How about if the taxpayer makes the mistake you know, with the information they give the preparer and is the preparer liable for anything there? For maybe not asking enough questions or something? Or? There are some uh, input things where IRS is looking more at things like earned income credit, another home, we talked about home deduction, mm -hmm. um, the IRS can penalize the preparer if IRS thinks the preparer hasn't been acting in good faith or has been reckless, okay. uh, maybe promises people refunds and works some numbers so that everybody that that person has a tax does a return for gets a refund. They see a pattern of conduct where that sort of behavior is happening then I think we're going to see some uh, penalties taken against the tax preparer. IRS can sanction tax preparers. Okay. Uh, so it would depend on how out of bounds the mistake would be. Yeah. Uh, but normally, no. Uh, you know, there's a lot of detail in a tax return, and yeah. the tax preparers are doing. We're seeing more and more work done in a shorter, shorter period because the forms are coming out later. Uh, Congress oftentimes is making changes, and then things like stockbrokers have corrected statements, so people are a little gun shy with going in to see the preparer because right. they don't want to spend all the time and the next thing you know they get amended statement from the securities person and you have to redo the whole tax return. So the whole, if you will, season is being more and more compressed mm -hmm. and so the taxpayers are actually, uh, the preparers, uh, the people who do a lot of returns are really feeling the pressure of, of getting all that work done in a timely manner. Okay, we got about uh, two and a half minutes or so, not or so, it's getting less and less here. A um, couple of big do's and don'ts as we approach April 15th. Suppose you don't have enough money to pay or... Well, here would be the biggest one, and the one I see that's the most, uh, the most disturbing to me. File your tax return. Uh, the largest penalties are for not filing. It can be up to 50% of just filing. Uh, and so even if you don't have the money, uh, no problem. Get that return filed. You can also do an automatic extension. Uh, by filing an automatic extension, you get six months to file, no penalties. And this is with state also? Yeah, the state of Ohio will piggyback on the federal elections. Mm -hmm. So the number one thing, Mike, would get that tax return filed. Uh, that's the worst thing that could happen. It's the worst penalties. It also, 
uh, if you go out actually past October 15th, then we get into a little bit of a gray area because you're really not technically compliant with the tax code. Uh, very rare for somebody to have a criminal case against them, but not paying your taxes is purely a civil matter. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody goes to jail uh, on a tax return that's properly prepared, but they just don't pay. Uh, you might have your car impounded, you could have your house foreclosed, you could have your uh, cash account grabbed, but you would never go to jail uh, for just not paying. But we do have people that go to jail who don't file their tax returns and are in non-compliance with, uh, with filing uh, 1040s with the IRS. So even if you, say, make a complete hash of your return, but you, <laughs> you get it in, uh, you're okay? I mean, well, there'll be some kickback probably. But. Well, let's say the return is done properly, yeah. uh, but the taxpayer just can't pay. Right. And what often happens with those folks is they're just nervous, they're embarrassed, they uh, feel very spastic in, in not filing a tax return because they can't pay the tax. They need to get over that. They need to file the tax return. The numbers are what they are. It's not going to be any different if you don't file in two years as opposed to filing in, in 14 and you wait until 17 to file. The numbers are the numbers. Okay. Uh, but what you save is an enormous amount They're cut me off. of penalty. You're going to cut me off. I th think you got it all in. Hey, thanks for watching, everybody. You've been watching you and the law, thanking all the volunteers behind the scenes who have made the program possible, thanking Chris Cowan for taking time out of his busy day to come over here and tell us about taxes. I've been your producer and host. I'm Mike Monda. Thank you for joining us on You and the Law. We'll see you again next time. Good night.